Welcome to the Think Like a Musician podcast. This show will teach you the time management skills you need to be joyful, productive, and fulfilled in all areas of life. You're going to learn a completely unique and innovative approach to managing your crazy, busy life. I'm a lifelong musician, so you're going to hear a musician's creative and intuitive system for time management and work-life balance. We'll discuss time management, work-life balance, goal setting, inspiration, creativity, peak performance, and living your purpose. I want to help you live your life like it's a masterpiece. I'm a life coach, professional speaker, productivity expert, and your host, Scott Snow. (laughs) Time to be petrified because we're getting ready for Halloween. It's a little early, but I'm a Halloween horror movie nut, so I'm already getting started. Actually, I have my 60-day countdown that began beginning of September for Halloween. So I'm watching a horror movie each night. I started with Motel Hell. I watched this documentary called The Leap of Faith with the director of The Exorcist, and I was so moved by it. I mean, this guy is just brilliant with how he his mastery of you know the history of film, even art, like he knows so much about art and music, very well versed in music. And I think he's a very musical director. I'm interested to see French Connection in, in his other movies too, but Spielberg is another guy who's a very musical director. I remember John Williams talking about that once that he just, the, the film that he makes without the music even is already musical. So it's pretty easy for a composer to get some ideas and get the blood flown. So with this documentary, Leap of Faith, which I highly recommend, it's all just speaking with Friedkin, and he talks about all of his inspiration and a lot of the inside scoop of the movie, and I found it awesome. First thing is that he was saying that the only film that inspired him um, with The Exorcist is this movie called Ord, O-R-D-E-T, which was made in 1955. And he just loved the elegant simplicity of it. And the movie was really kind of shot like a play. So it was very intimate. And that he tried to carry through in his movie, The Exorcist. And he really tried to get the audience to just completely believe what was happening. And that was his focus. He talks about the opening of the movie, which is in Iraq on an archaeological dig in Iraq. And it's some beautiful cinematography and and film footage because he talks about how they a lot of people told him to cut the whole intro in Iraq to the movie Exorcist but he said it sets the mood completely it's it sets everything up and he says setting the mood is everything that's just as important as any one scene and that can be brought along in any project that you do he was strongly influenced by music that builds and layers you know, he talked about Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring, which actually begins with a solo instrument. I forget what woodwind instrument it begins. Maybe you can tell me in the comments. But it starts with just a simple one instrument line. He says, because if you start with drums, you got to end with thunder <laughs> to make it bigger. Friedkin really thinks of The Exorcist as like a chamber piece not a big spectacle. Of course, the movie became a huge spectacle when it came out, midnight showings and all of that. But really, the most important scenes in The Exorcist are shot in one room, the little girl's room, Reagan. So it really was like a chamber piece. It's very focused in. He says that works of art are really made up of a lot of different small pieces put together, make up the whole work. Kind of like the Jackson Pollock painting is made up of tiny dots and splashes everywhere. And a Monet is made of tiny brush strokes and that gives it the impressionistic perspective. Friedkin was very interested in spontaneity more so than perfection. So he liked to do one or two takes and that's it. Unlike. Stanley Kubrick, who would do 90 or 100 takes. I was surprised to hear Friedkin talk in musical terms. Like he talked about a scene needing more brass, not strings. 
he uses the term grace note a lot, which in musical terms, like for drums, it's a small, tiny note right before a, a more prominent note as I'm playing on my stomach. For him, grace note means this is something that you remember about an experience. It tells you something profound. It's the details. It doesn't so much move the story along. It's what Reagan's mother notices while she's walking down the street. Kids walking with their uh, trick-or-treat costumes or two nuns and their flowing robes are moving in the breeze. It's just a detail, but it's very telling. It's very important. It's, it sets the mood. It has a, a, a cumulative emotional effect. I love how he said that right after the detective leaves the house, he's kind of questioning because something happened and he's wondering what, you know, if he has any information, if, if the mom has any information. And as soon as he leaves, they close the door. There's, he put in, the director put in a tiny um, grandfather clock starts to tick in the background. And he says, that's basically like lighting the fuse because everything goes haywire right after that guy leaves. But you would never pick that up. So I find that to be very interesting. All these tiny things that a creator, an artist, will craft into their piece of art, you're not aware of, but it has a real effect. And if you've got a whole bunch of them, you can see why art touches us so strongly in music all that craft and the care that's put into it. Fritz Lang, the director of the famous 1927 film Metropolis, silent film, talked about how he had this mindset of like, he said he made his films with a sleepwalking security, meaning every decision is the right one. And there's no questions. He just follows his gut, follows his instincts completely. And Friedkin also tried to do that same thing. That's called being in the flow. Now, what audio brings to art is what we, oh, Friedkin said that what audiences bring to the movie is what they take away from it. So you could relate that to all art. Whatever you bring to it is what you take away. I like that. So lots of interesting things from The Exorcist as we get ready for Halloween. Amanda Seals is an actress, and in this article, she was described as being a comedian, actor, podcaster, activist, musician, painter, author, and DJ. That's all her roles. That's what we talk about here and think like a musician. We have our set list, and that's the roles, a list of roles that we play. So she's got a lot of different roles, very rich, very cool, exciting. But she added a very interesting point. She says to juggle all of those roles, she has what she calls her skeleton key. And that's comedy. So that's what connects, that's what makes her do her job even better. That's her bread and butter. Her wheelhouse is her comedy. And the skeleton key image I really like because that's just a key without any grooves in the middle. So it's a, a hollowed out key without all those grooves that can fit into any lock. So that's like what, what the custodian would have or, you know, someone that keep, the keeper of the keys has this key, has this key that can access all locks. So I love that image. Another thing that she did that I thought was very clever and that we could learn from Amanda is um, she brainstormed celebrities that already had the type of career that she wanted. I think that's so profound. Example, Chris Rock, Chelsea Handler, Ellen DeGeneres, they already have it going on to what she wants to have. So she knows that is her vision. What they have in common is that they worked in multiple mediums. They did everything based on their point of view because you can never run out of being yourself which is what I try to do on this podcast and my social as well. For her, stand-up comedy was the connector between her roles. So stand-up comedians can host, they can produce, they can write, and many other jobs. She often gets the feeling that entertainment, and she says she always, she said that she often gets the feeling in entertainment that if it doesn't feel relatable to white people, then it won't be a success. But she says, the truth is 
authenticity is relatable to everybody, regardless of race, nation, or creed. So being authentic will always win in the end. That's empowering as well. She has a YouTube channel called Amanda Land, which I checked out and I saw one episode. I thought it was hilarious. She just gives her opinion and she was sitting in bed. She, then she, um, she's, she's going on a tirade and then she says, all right, I'm, then she closes up and she has a mask for her eyes and she goes like she's going to sleep and then she gets up and she goes, now I'm going to bed mad. <laughs> so she's fun. I've taken up a new hobby, knot tying. This is a fun little hobby that is useful. You can always use it around the house. And it's, it's kind of cool. It connects you with like the Navy and, uh, you know, being on a boat. Here, I'll try to do a, uh, I'll tie a, a bowline right quick here. That's the first knot I learned how to do. And Got it. And there's the bowling. So it's a fun little hobby. I like hobbies that you can do for five minutes a day. They really add to your richness of life. In fact, my sister-in-law's dad um, was a Navy veteran and uh, he's since passed, but he was really into knots. And in fact, they had a whole framed thing that was beautiful, I guess, of all different knots that you could learn and I wish I had gotten the chance to talk to him about some, some of those knots. I also like to do backgammon and blackjack on the phone a couple of minutes a day, three or four minutes, maybe 10 minutes. Doing drum lessons again. I'm, I think I'm gonna be start teaching drum lessons again. I haven't done that in 20 years, so I'm looking forward to that, but I'm gonna to have to start practicing every day, a couple of minutes. The beauty of taking up a musical instrument really is this idea of practice, you know, where every day you get back, you've got to reinforce the basics all the time. Even the greatest performers in the world have to get back to the basics, long tones, or, you know, for drums, eight on the hand and the rudiments. And most people think it's just fun to sit down and play an instrument and, you know, you're, you're amazing, you sit down and do it. But really, I find that when you sit down, you're, you're like staring down the beast every time you sit down again. You're like, all right, where did we leave this battle? And actually, my knot tying habit saved the day a while back. We had to um, pick up all the leaf. We picked up all the leaves and um, we needed a big tarp. And to tie that tarp onto the back of the golf cart so we could drag it, we needed a real strong knot. And I came through in the last minute. Save the day. As you know, I'm an avid newspaper reader. I read three newspapers every morning, like Clockwork, the Boston Globe, Wall Street Journal, and the New York Times, and the Harvard Business Review. And what I like to do when I'm reading the paper is jot down color words, new vocabulary, language that I like, things that I find uh, written well. So here's some example of some phrases that I wrote down in the last two weeks, I'd say, of reading the paper that really have that self-development angle to it. They could be applied to self-development. Poverty of empathy at the top. Change takes energy. Jumble of pieces the New York Giants keep throwing together. Has sweeping strategic implications. Momentous decision, chewed on big ideas, worked it over in her head, atrocious inaction, deeply uncharismatic, fraught with uncertainty, became a joyless binary journey, professed the mantra of transformative, appetite for change, grievance of the weak, curdled by criticism, laudable goals, rendered invisible by their own mediocrity, Quietly forged, deeper sense of belonging, changes afoot, willingness to make bold decisions on the cusp of change. People are used to thinking of her on the victim side of the ledger. Deep dive, put forth a bold vision for, passionately mediocre. This was a description of George Con Constanza's um, character in Seinfeld. Passionately mediocre. 
and stop gaps that fail to address the underlying problem. And that's just a reminder to focus on the language we use every day, the words and the phrases. What are you saying? And what are you listening to every day? Now I have a crazy comparison. Janis Joplin versus Billie Eilish. This idea came to me, um, I think it was because I was watching one of the Grammy Awards and Billie Eilish was performing. And great, she's very successful, I'm happy for. Her. But I find that the style of like listening to her new album, it, it seems to me like she puts in so little energy, it, it irks me. It's like she's, they've got the, the beat going, and she's like, eh, here, oh, eh, here. Eh. It's like you couldn't put out any less energy compared to like a Janis Joplin and a lot of the classic rock bands that just put everything on the line. So it's such a contrast. And I think it must have something to do with our the generations today, like the way things have come about and changed and where we are as a society, I think. I really miss that putting everything out and you know just leaving everything out. Now I guess it's the sports players that do that. And the musicians the popular ones are very, very limited in what they express. I know this is an overgeneralization, but some of the new, I like hard rock music and heavy metal. And I find myself, I find myself to be disappointed with a lot of the new hard rock music coming out too. You know, I love bands like Judas Priest and Iron Maiden and Metallica, Ozzy and Black Sabbath. And I remember um, the Anthrax guitarist, Scott Ian, described Judas Priest as, the, as having a barrel full of evil in their sound. And I love that phrase. And it's true. They have that attitude. It's like, uh, that to me is like rock and roll. Like it, it's like, you're a bad, you're, you're rebellious, you're bad news, and you enjoy being this, you know, troublemaker. But I see some of the bands now, it's almost like they have all of these albums, you know, and artists that came before of geniuses. And it's almost like a child in a room full with all these great toys and they got two toys and they're just clunking them together. Like that's how they're creating. I just don't get it. Like that's, that's a very, I mean, toddlers that I guess that is a stage in creative play where you have things and you just clank them together. But the next step would be to actually use that, like this is a train and this is a car, or this is a football and that's a train and you use them in different ways. And I don't know. Now, one documentary I watched that I really liked is called Count Me In. And I don't know if that was HBO or Netflix, but it's an awesome documentary about drummers, the history of drummers and all the drummers that came before you and influenced you. And that's one thing I really love about drummers in the community, the family of drummers, is they're, they're not afraid to talk about how drummers before them influenced them and made them passionate about drumming. It seemed like a very clear thing that they were all just gushing about drummers before them, whether it was Buddy Rich or Elvin Jones or Ringo Starr, John Bonham, Keith Moon. I never knew Keith Moon was such a storyteller behind the drums before really focusing in and watching him play. Like he was just, he would color all the lyrics with how he played in his expressions. Very, very expressive drummer. And he was a wild man, total wild man. You know, putting his Mercedes Benz in the swimming pool and just totally out of control. I do want to get a couple posters of Keith Moon because he's a wild man. But they talked about just being happy that they were playing drums and making a living, you know, they're only making like $165 a week is what Chad Smith said from uh, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, but he's doing it. John Bonham was already a mature player at 19, making innovations with his bass drum and, you know, the, the 16th note triplet bass drum patterns that he did with his foot. They talked about how uh, you don't have to have perfect time to be a great drummer, like Charlie Watts. God rest his soul, we just lost him. They talked about um, the song Brown Sugar, where he starts at a tempo 
And then as the song goes up, he picks up the tempo and gets faster because the music gets more exciting and more moving. I went to UMass Amherst for uh, drums and music education. And I remember we always had um, two guys that came a lot and we were very fortunate to get these big jazz legends. Max Roach on the drums would come and do workshops and Billy Taylor would often come and lecture classes and give some, some uh, master classes. And Max Roach, I remember him talking about time that you don't have to exactly play with the metronome with a band like that the time is really, I forget, he gave some kind of a um, formula. Like it was the tempo of the metronome times, you know, how you feel and all these things, but it wasn't perfect, like a, like a machine. Had to breathe, you know, musically. And Billy Taylor was always a class act, like he was very elegant, beautiful player. I need to get more of his old albums because he played with everyone way back, you know, in the 40s when bebop started in New York City. He was right there playing with everyone. He was the house pianist. And I loved his big, huge, uh, fancy, like diamond rimmed glasses. And he had humongous like dentures or teeth. Uh, he was definitely a original looking guy, but nice as can be and just very giving of his, of his talents. And I always appreciated that. Well, before we wrap up, I wanted to offer you something very important. This is a three session coaching package that is free. Three 30 minute individual coaching sessions with me, whether on the phone or through Zoom. And in that we will talk about your roles and goals. So by the end, you'll have a whole list of all the different hats you wear, the different roles you play and your mini mission statements for each of those roles and the goals that you have. Did you know there are four types of goals? Well, we'll talk about all four of those when we meet. And maybe I'll ask for a little testimonial if you've got a lot out of it. That's it, no risk to you and uh, lots of benefit. So in order to claim that, because this is on a limited time, just text me 774-230-3928 and put in a secret message, roles and goals. Then I'll know what you want and I'll give you a buzz back and we'll put it on the calendar and this will change your life. Having that overview and the perspective of your busy life, seeing all those moving parts to your life, it's gonna change how you plan your entire week, I guarantee. So text me 774-230-3928 to claim your three individual coaching sessions, change your life.